So the Yo Ivans Award is awarded annually each year in recognition for outstanding contributions to corrosion science and engineering. And you can see there a picture of Ulrich himself. He was in the Royal Society, he was considered the father of the modern science of corrosion, corrosion protection. And it's almost a hundred years ago that he wrote the, his, his book, Corrosion and Metals. So that might be something to consider for the, the broader corrosion community as they're coming up to that, that centenary. So the award is, has traditionally always been um, presented and, and the plenary talk has been given at the Corrosion Science Symposium because right at its inception, you, um, your Evans wanted the, the recipient to, to communicate and present the ideas to junior members of the corrosion community. Now, traditionally, the, the award address is, is made by the president of the Institute of Corrosion. So I'd now like to hand over to, to Gav Hines. Thank you, Julian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and good afternoon to Bob. It gives me great pleasure to present Bob with the UR Evans Award. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do this in person. It would be very nice to be able to present the sword itself to Bob, but given the current situation, I, th I think uh, this, is, this is the next best thing. Hopefully there will be an opportunity in the near future to make the presentation uh, and take some nice photographs so that we have it recorded for posterity. So maybe I'll just say a little bit about the UR Evans Award to add to what Julian said. It is the most prestigious award that the Institute of Corrosion uh, bestows. It's been awarded every year since 1976 and UR Evans, as we all know, was pretty much the father of modern day corrosion science. I'm fortunate enough to have a copy of his book that's actually signed by the man himself. It was presented to one of my um, predecessors at NPL uh, and it's found its way into, into my bookshelf. So I, I'm always struck when reading this book uh, about how far ahead of his time he was in particularly the study of the electrochemistry of corrosion. Um, so I think it's very fitting that the list of recipients that we have for this award uh, really is a who's who um, at the very top of the corrosion science field. Uh, and Bob is a very worthy addition to this list. Just a few uh, words about uh, Bob's career. Um, he's, he's spent it in Manchester between UMIST and what's now the University of Manchester. Uh, and he really has made uh, a significant contribution, not just to research, but to the teaching of corrosion science. Uh, and uh, I know this particularly through my um, liaison with the European Federation of Corrosion, where Bob has been particularly active and played a leadership role in Working Party 7 corrosion education. So Bob joined UMIST in 1979, initially as a lecturer uh, and then progressing to senior lecturer, reader, and finally professor. He made a huge contribution to the teaching of corrosion um, at Manchester through a distance learning approach to the MSc in corrosion control engineering, the development of courseware through ECOR, uh, and in 2005 uh, he was recognised by NACE International with the TJ Hull Award uh, for contribution to NACE in the field of publications. His contributions to the science uh, have been many and notable. I'll just mention a few here, the mechanistic understanding of corrosion fatigue and the role of corrosion in uh, crack initiation, initiation and growth, the use of electrochemical techniques uh, and the interpretation of the results from those. Uh, and he continues to do that after his retirement, continuing to study and pioneer um, electrical noise measurements as I'm, I'm hoping that we will hear this afternoon. Uh, and he's done a lot of modeling work too on the statistical interpretation of pitting corrosion, algorithms for alloy corrosion, uh, and uh, neural network methods for modeling of corrosion processes. So truly world leading contributions to corrosion science. Uh, and I'm sure that the University of Manchester is rightly uh, proud of Bob for everything that he's achieved. So it gives me great pleasure to formally present in the absence of the sword, the UR Evans Award for 2020 to Professor Bob Cottis. Well done, Bob. Thank you very much, uh, Gareth. I was hoping you might have a little man outside with the sword, which I gather they're doing on one of the, uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's the Golden Globes, or the, I saw it on the news this morning, but uh, I guess that would be a little tricky. Anyway, um, I, I'm very honoured to receive this award. Um, I'm preceded by many of my colleagues from Manchester. Um, 
and I'm very pleased to join them. Um, I, can, I am one up on you as far as your Evans books are concerned because I have his personal copy with his corrections in it, which I inherited from David Scantlebury. <laughs> and I think he, he inherited it from the, from, uh, I think possibly Jack Mayne. I'm not quite sure how he got hold of it, but it, it's, that's, it's in my bookcase at the moment. Anyway, thank you very much. Right, um, I, I was wondering what to say in this presentation and um, the, the area that I've been most interested in recent years has been electrochemical noise and it's an area where there's a lot of information but there's also a lot of misinformation and, and knowing that this is a presentation to the more junior members of the profession if I can put it that way um, I thought it would be useful to give a summary of my own impressions and opinions about electrochemical noise, um, which may be a little bit um, controversial in some cases, but that's hard luck. I, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I just, uh, why, is my, why isn't my mouse working? Oh, there we are. Now the first measurements of electrochemical noise were made by Iverson in about 1968. Uh, he was using a moving coil chart recorder to monitor the corrosion of uh, um, a corroding electrode in um, a solution, which I think was a salt solution, I'm not sure offhand. Um, it may be interesting again to the more junior members of the profession to see that this was a this was a formal publication in I think the Journal of the Electrochemical Society at that time and you realize how graphics has changed in the last uh, 50 years. Um, this was the best we could do. There are a few hand scrawled no notes on this because this is Carol Hadke's original copy uh, these he put on the web so people could find it more easily. Anyway, he, was, he observed that there was a fluctuations in the, the potential as a function of time, which he attributed as having something to do with corrosion. Now, this was picked up by various other people, and essentially we've developed a number of methods of measurement of electrochemical noise. And I'll just go through these quickly. Essentially, we have the potential noise method that uh, Iverson originally used. We have a sample relative to a reference electrode. We monitor its potential with a a voltage recording device. We can also measure a current noise if we have two working electrodes that are hopefully identical or at least very similar and we can monitor the current between them with an ammeter that drops very little potential so we call it a zero resistance ammeter. Um, we can also do a similar current measurement by using a potentiostat to hold the potential of a specimen at a constant value and observe the fluctuation in current. That's a little bit more tricky because we have to worry about the noise introduced by the potentiostat, which can be significant. And some of the early work that uh, Ugo Batocci and others did, um, it was really looking at the noise, how the noise produced by the potentiostat polarized the electrode and allowed them to measure essentially a polarization resistance using a, a noise a perturbation. Um, in about uh, 1992, or a little before that, I guess, David and John Dawson and uh, Gareth John um, worked out that you could measure potential and current simultaneously by using two working electrodes and a reference electrode, coupled up with a, an ammeter measure to measure the current and a voltmeter to measure the potential. And this is nowadays more or less the conventional standard way of making the measurement. So what is it? Why do we get electrochemical noise? Well, conventional electrochemical theory says that the, the net current to an electrode must be zero because there's no other external circuit, um, which implies, of course, that the anodic current is equal to the cathodic current, in which case, why is there any noise? But of course, this is only a time average and the current is balanced by charge and discharge of the double layer capacitance adsorption processes and other processes. So the, the anodic current is not necessarily exactly the same as the cathodic current at any point in time. So we can say that the anodic current is equal to the cathodic current plus the non-faradaic current. And that essentially is how we develop potential differences and current, diff and current flows between the two electrodes that we're studying. 
So where does the noise come from? Well, we can look at a range of processes that can give rise to noise. And I'll start at the, the quietest of these processes in the sense that the one that produces the smallest fluctuation, and that is elementary electrochemical reactions. So if I consider iron going into ferrous ions uh, plus two electrons, oxygen being reduced to hydroxyl ions, if we consider a very short time interval so that only a few reactions occur, and if we assume that the reactions are uncorrelated, that is to say one iron atom goes into solution independently of all the other iron atoms on the surface and it doesn't care about when one went into solution previously and so on, um, the number of samples, number of reactions occurring in a, at a time, a short time delta t will be samples from a Poisson distribution. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, this is I've sketched out a Poisson distribution for different numbers of events occurring within the time interval. So if, if we have half an event on average occurring within the time interval, so one every two delta t, we will get a distribution like this. We, there's a 0.6% sorry, 0.6 probability of no reactions, 0.3 probability of one reaction, and so on, and the re remaining. Point one is a series of higher numbers occurring in the interval. If we go to two reactions occurring in the time interval, we start to see a peak developing, developing at the beginning of the reaction because now it's becoming less likely that we'll have no reactions occurring. If we look at larger numbers, so we see a peak developing that looks very much like the normal distribution. If I blow this up, um, you can see something that looks very much like the normal distribution. And in fact, it's a result of the central limit theorem of statistics that this is asymptotically approaches a normal distribution as we have a larger number of reactions occurring. So where we're looking at electrochemical reactions, where we have very, very many reactions occurring with any reasonable time interval, we can essentially say that the um, number of reactions occurring and within one time interval will be a sample from the normal distribution and it turns out that the standard deviation is equal to the square root of the mean in that situation. Now from that Schottky in 1918 worked out the maths looking at electron flow in vacuum tubes where there were issues about the noise being generated and uh, basically if we start off with a charge on the electron of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb, sorry I left the coulomb off there, um, you can come up with this equation which says that the standard deviation of current is two, sorry it's the square root of two times the charge times the current times the bandwidth of the measurement because that basically is saying how long a time interval we're considering overall in our measurement. Um, we can also express this in terms of the power per unit of frequency or the power spectral density and that is equal to 2qi. So it's basically this number squared because we say power is proportional to the square of current um, and the delta f disappears because this is per unit of frequency. And if we look at the typical values that we, we would expect for a one electron reaction or for the standard Schottky noise where we're just considering electrons and if we have a typical corrosion rate corresponding to one millimeter a year of something like 10 to the minus four amps per square centimeter, we look at a bandwidth of one hertz, which is fairly typical for electrochemical noise measurements, we will get a standard deviation of current of about six times 10 to the minus 12 amps. That is almost impossible to measure. So these sorts of uh, noise levels are very, very difficult to measure. I think uh, the younger Mesherosh was trying to look at this at some time. I'm not sure how, whether he made any progress on it. Um, the noise that we get from shot noise is what is known as white. It has a constant power per unit of frequency or, or a constant power spectral density. And when we talk about power, as I said, we talk about current squared or we talk about voltage squared. And as I say, short noise produces white noise. Now, there's a possibility, and we hypothesized this a long time ago, I'm, never, I'm not sure if anyone has really demonstrated it, 
there's a possibility that corrosion reactions will occur in bursts of hundreds or thousands of atoms. And the logic behind this hypothesis is that if we consider a ledge of atoms on a, a crystal surface, this is the most likely region to react because it's very difficult to pick um, an atom out of the flat surface because you can't get much water molecule much or many water molecules around the atom to um, hydrate it. So the most likely place for an atom to dissolve is on this ledge. It's still quite difficult because it's still there's still a lot of steric hindrance of the approach of water molecules to that atom. Once we can remove one of those atoms, however, we find that we've now got two ends of a row of atoms that are a little bit more accessible. And once those become available, they will, are likely to react more quickly. So it's reasonable to suppose that essentially this row of atoms will unzip and give us a burst of current proportional to the length of that ledge of atoms, which is likely to be, as I say, hundreds or thousands of atoms. Now, this is something we hypothesize. I'm not sure if it's relevant for real situation where we have surface films on the metal. So it may be a, a theoretical rather than a practical situation, but it's another way in which we could get larger amplitudes of shot noise because we're increasing the charge. And if we go back a moment, Remember that the standard deviation of current or, the, or is proportional to the square root of the charge. So if we get a, a charge of 100, we'll get 10 times as much standard deviation. So it becomes that much more likely that we'll be able to measure it. Now here's an example of another way in which we can create potential noise and this is work that Gillian Bagley did uh, in our lab um, and this is showing in green the current signal or the current between two working electrodes and the potential of those two working electrodes and we see that we get a pulse of current from the electrode or from one of the electrodes and that gives rise to a drop in the potential and then that gradually rises back up again. Now first I should make it clear that rise is due to recharging of the double layer capacitance. It's nothing to do with the corrosion process. There was some confusion over this in earlier work. Um, and the thing we can do here for example is if we've got a patient research student we can measure the charge under that current transit and we can say that much charge has happened therefore we'll have lost that much metal so we expect a pit of that size. Um, it's patient work, it's time consuming but it's a very good way of analyzing these sort of data when you get a nice clear picture like this. Unfortunately we don't always get nice clear picture this is also pitting corrosion and you can see we could not possibly conceive of analyzing potential transients because they're it's all over the place, the voltage is all over the place, the current is all over the place. So we have to look at alternative methods and we'll come on to those uh, later. I'd also make the point that stable pitting is not really expected to do this sort of thing. I mean what I was talking about was strictly metastable pitting where pits initiate, propagate for a time and then die. If we have stable pitting, uh, th theoretically it should just give an increase in current as the kit pit gets bigger. Now that may not happen in reality because it may well be there are factors such as solution flow or limits of the current or various things, changes in environment that will, will stop a pit after a time. But stable pitting will not, I would not expect stable pitting to give a reliable source of uh, electrochemical noise. This is rarely observed in laboratory studies. Now it's po that's possibly due to the fact that we're using very small specimens. So we don't actually have enough cathodic current capacity to, to drive um, pits for long times. But I'm not sure quite why that is. So another source of potential source of uh, uh, electrochemical noise is crevice corrosion. And there are different ways in, this can in which this can behave. This is some work from uh, Yang Luo and Wilmot in 98. 
I'm afraid I don't remember what their environment or metal, metal was, but you can see here you've got a sort of a noisy behavior, but then it starts to oscillate. And the oscillation continues, and this is actually showing the later period in the experiment where the oscillation died out. And I think I, this, this strikes me as being a bit similar to an organ pipe resonating. And I think possibly that's why you get this, this resonant behavior. Um, but that's not necessarily what crevice corrosion looks like. It can also look like this. And here we see a stainless steel sample that is gradually passivating. There are indications of pitting as the, as the passive uh, film develops and the potential rises, but eventually the potential gets high enough that the passive, that the crevice activates. And we get a large drop in potential as the crevice polarizes the external surface. And essentially now we're seeing stable crevice corrosion. There's an indication here that perhaps the crevice tried to repassivate, but then uh, the passivity broke down again and so on. But again, this is another source of electrochemical noise, but we wouldn't be able to analyze it by most of the techniques that people have been looking at. And we can see what's happening if we look at the time record, which is a message I will try to emphasize as we go through. You can also get um, noise from bubbling, from bubble evolution. And this is work again from Gillian Bagley, where she was looking at a carbon steel in hydrochloric acid solution, a dilute hydrochloric acid. And you can see you just get a noisy trace. This curve incidentally shows an error that can occur in these sorts of measurements. Um, if you look at this carefully, you can see that the height of these steps here is 10 microvolts. And that was the resolution of the voltmeter that Gillian was using to make her measurements. We couldn't do any better at the time. These days we should be able to get rather better measurements than that. Um, but this is a potential problem in electrochemical noise measurement. The values can be very low and it can be difficult to make the measurements. This sort of noise incidentally is known as quantization noise because the current is quantized and it's giving these steps. We can also get noise from stress corrosion cracking. I think Akin Loto was the first person to look at this in 1986, the late Akin Loto, I fear. Um, Abdus Salam Jabril looked at it uh, again in our lab in 2005, where he was looking at stainless steel in boiling magnesium chloride. Uh, he induced a residual stress by bending, and then we use this sort of bending jig to put a permanent plastic deformation into the specimen. That gives rise to stresses on the inside and outside of the bent plate as it relaxes and basically where it was in compression when you when it was bent when it relaxes back it goes into tension and uh, he looked at the noise that was being developed in that situation again you can see current and potential transients if you expand the scale you can see the individual transients to some extent now he had a problem in that work because the stainless steel suffered from pitting as well as stress corrosion cracking and so we had a, a difficulty in uh, separating the two processes but i'll show you some plots later on which indicate a way in which we might be able to get at that sort of a problem you can also get flow effects um, mukta shagluf was looking at uh, what happened when you removed an inhibitor from a system and so here he has his inhibited solution he started to switch the solution using a peristaltic pump. So pumping the inhibited solution out, pumping, pumping uninhibited, uninhibited solution in. And we got this strange behavior during the pumping process and then it went quiet again. And that, we attribute this to the pump. This is the flow induced by the pump. And again, I'll show you later where we looked at this in what we looked at the flow effects specifically and you can see some of the effects that flow has. So those are some of the ways in which we can get electrochemical noise which gives us a clue as to how we can understand what's happening when we look at the data. And so now I want to look at how we interpret the data. And again these are some of the ways that can be used and I'll start by looking at just looking at the time record. So we can do visual examination of the time records. We've already seen time records, so you can get an idea of what you can see. I would argue that it's the best method to use when you can see clear, distinct transients, or indeed when you can see a clear behavior as we saw with the crevice corrosion case. 
or possibly also you can see things like flow effects show up in a way that wouldn't show up if you did the more complex analysis. The problem is it's time consuming, it's hard to automate, consequently it's hard to use for monitoring corrosion processes where you want simple numbers that can be put up in a um, control room. Again, if we look at the pitting of carbon steel, you can, we've looked at this already and you can see here, you can analyze these to get amounts of metal dissolved and so forth. Here's some more data. This again, it, this is pitting of aluminium due to Axel Holmberg. Um, and the problem there, sorry, if I just go back a second, the problem here is again, you can't see these clear transients. So we have to look at other ways of doing things. Next sort of thing you can consider is some doing some statistics. So you could look at the standard deviation of current or the standard deviation of potential. Now, a high amplitude of potential noise suggests that you have localized corrosion. And again, we'll see why this is a little bit later when we look at the shot noise analysis. A high amplitude of current noise suggests that there's a high corrosion rate, but it doesn't relate directly to the corrosion rate. If on the other hand, we divide the potential noise by the current noise, we get the noise resistance. So we, we divide the standard deviation of potential by the standard deviation of current. To get the units right, we multiply by the areas to give us ohms meters squared as units. Um, this is known as the noise resistance and we can measure it with a convention, that conventional three electrode measurement that I showed you earlier. Arguably, it's better to measure it from the power spectra. Um, and again, I'll go into that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and to measure it as the low frequency amplitude of the power spectral density or the most square root of the power spectral density rather over the power spectral density of current. Um, the reason for saying this is better is it because it's be it gives us better control over the frequency at which the measurement is made. And either way, however we measure it, this leads to a, a way of estimating the corrosion rate via the conventional Stern-Geary equation. Um, it, it's exactly analogous to the polarization resistance. Most experiments that have been done have demonstrated that noise resistance is equal, is essentially equal to the polarization resistance. And I think most differences probably occur because of differences in the effective frequencies that are being used in the measurement. So we can measure the corrosion rate with electrochemical noise. If we now look at the analysis of shot noise based on the work of Schottky, and if we um, do a little bit of manipulation and we remember that the Stern-Geary equation will enable us to, to relate corrosion rate to the electrochemical noise resistant, we can work out what the value of Q is and we can work out what the frequency of events is. So if we have a number of events or we have events of amplitude Q coulombs occurring at an average frequency of Fn uh, per, per second, um, we can say that Q is equal to the power spectral density of um, potential over the power spectral density of current divided by B. Uh, which is equal to the variance or sigma squared of potential over sigma squared of current divided by B. And I think I've made a mistake here. One of these, one of the things things can't be right. I think that must be PS, power spectral density of potential, not power spectral density squared. I think that square is wrong, um, but I, need, I didn't get a chance to check that. Um, and so we, we can measure the, the charge and the average current, if average frequency of the charge generating events, which we call the characteristic frequency uh, of the process um, from a shot noise analysis. Now, the interesting thing here is if we have a low frequency and presumably correspondingly a relatively large charge, this suggests that we have a localized corrosion process. The only important factor to remember about this is that this must be made at sufficiently low a frequency that the events that generate this charge must be short compared to the measurement bandwidth. So if, if, we're, if we have things that are lasting for seconds, we have to measure the um, 
we have to measure these properties, the power spectral density at frequencies much less than hertz. So we have to go down to millihertz or tens of millihertz perhaps to get a, a, to be sure that we're making a reasonable measurement. If we go to higher frequencies, we will be getting a measurement which tells us a part also about the shape of the transients that are being produced. And again, I can come on to that a bit later perhaps. Now we can use this sort of approach to try and discriminate between different processes. And this was some, some work that Hannah Almazidi did. Um, and she was looking at a steel in nitrite chloride mixture and a carbon dioxide sodium chloride thioacetamide mixture. And so she was looking at three conditions depending on how she adjusted her compositions. She was looking at pitting corrosion, which corresponds to the black points. She was looking at inhibited or passive conditions, which is the blue points. And she was looking at active corrosion, which is the pink points. And I think you can see that there is reasonably good separation between the different regions of behavior. The, the reason we've got two different re black regions, two different blue regions, is that these two systems behave differently. And so the, the inhibited behavior on, on one of the samples is different from the passive behavior on the other system. And similarly, the pitting behavior, the localized corrosion behavior is different in the two systems. But you can see in general that the pitting occurs at low characteristic frequency and moderate noise resistance. That, that may be lower in some cases, so it may be the same corrosion rate as the, local, as the uniform corrosion rate in, in this case. The inhibited or passive behavior occurs at relatively high, high frequency, relatively high noise resistance, i.e. low corrosion rate, as you'd expect. And the uniform corrosion occurs at relatively high frequency, relatively low noise resistance. So this potentially gives us a way of separating conditions that are giving us pitting, uniform corrosion, and passivity. These are only based on two sets of measurements, of course, and I would expect that if you looked at different metal environment systems, these regions will occur in different places. So you would need to know your system if you're going to use this as, for example, as a monitoring technique. But providing you've calibrated, I think this should be a useful method for monitoring the behavior. Now, we can also use the shot noise analysis method in a slightly different way. And again, this is uh, Abdul Salam Jabril's data where, remember, we had a situation with stress corrosion cracking, but with pitting taking place at the same time. And we had the problem of trying to separate the two processes. And here we've got his two different sets of results. The blue lines correspond to curves where there was, we knew there was stress corrosion happening because there were cracks. The red curves correspond to conditions where we didn't see any cracks. So we assume that they are basically pitting. And, you, and while there is some overlap, you can see that there is a distinct shift between the pitting only region and the stress corrosion with pitting region. So there is a suggestion that we, we have different properties, possibly more and larger localized corrosion events when we get the stress corrosion cracking occurring than we get when we get the pitting corrosion. Having said that, it may just be that these specimens were pitting more. So it's, it's not a definite result. This sort of approach has been used by other people uh, more recently, and it's been used to look at um, to do viable analysis on these sorts of plots so they can look at and they can look at some of these things in a bit more detail. As I, as I said, I'm focusing mainly on people that have uh, been working with us have been doing. So that, those are the things that we can do uh, looking at the time record essentially or parameters that we describe we obtain from the time record, though I have mentioned a little bit about power spectral density. The next thing we can do is, look at, is to look at the frequency content of the signal. And this is where we look at frequency spectra. And this is useful when we have many overlapping transients. So we can't see individual transients in the time record. And, but if we look at the plot of the power spectral density, that is the power per unit of frequency against frequency. This is known as a power spectrum. We normally plot it on a log log plot. 
Um, this will help us to understand a little bit more about the process. There are various ways we can calculate the power spectrum. We, the, if you like, the pure mathematical way of doing it is to use the Fourier transform. Uh, the maximum entropy method has been used. It was, it was uh, promoted, if you like, by uh, some of the earlier workers in Manchester, particularly Carol Fladkin and Les Callow. Um, you can also derive it from the wavelet spectrum because I was looking at this with Axel Homburg recently and um, we demonstrated that wavelet methods, which I'm not going to say very much about, are essentially the same as uh, Fourier transform or, or frequency dependent methods. Um, they, they just look at things in a slightly different way and we can use a wavelet analysis to get a power spectrum. So here's an example of a, a power spectrum. This was uh, obtained by Francois Huet and his colleagues Gabrielle and Kedam in uh, Paris. And uh, you can see here a fairly typical behavior in a power spectrum, a low frequency plateau. This is, this is essentially white noise here because the power spectral density is independent of frequency. Then it rolls off and we get a slope here, or in this case, uh, two on the log scale here to one on the log scale here. So we're saying essentially that power is proportional to the square of frequency or inversely proportional to the square of frequency, I should say. And this is a typical behavior for a capacitance. And this, we see a similar thing here in the um, potential noise. Is that right? No, sorry, that's potential. That's kind of one interesting point here is that the point at which this turns over is 10 to the minus one hertz here and it's 10 to the minus two hertz here. So there is a difference between these two plots, um, which may tell us a little bit about mechanisms. And for example, this slope has been used and has been suggested as an indicator of whether uh, localized corrosion is occurring or not. I haven't got the graph here, but Gillian Bagley did do some analysis on this and she found that if you plotted this roll off slope against whether or not pitting was occurring, it was all over the place. So it's, I don't personally, personally believe it's a reliable indicator of localized corrosion, but some people have claimed that it is. I also mentioned earlier that we, we found an effect of flow and Mukhtar Shalgluf went on to look at this a bit in a bit more detail. And here's a series of power spectra looking at um, measurements made on a rotating disc electrode. And this, in this case, the rotating disc was polarized cathodically at um, 3.5 milliamps and the reason for this is so we don't damage the disc otherwise you get ruffling of the disc and it changes the behavior anyway um, and you can see here that we get a very clear transition in behavior between the 20 rpm line which is this yellowish line and the blue line which corresponds to 50 rpm and by other measurements standard measurements of uh, limiting current density we demonstrated that the flow went turbulent at 25 RPM. So this is a very clear effect of turbulence, changing the, the noise behavior and gen generating far higher levels of noise. So flow, turbulent flow can give rise to high levels of noise. And at this, of course, this sort of technique, particularly with um, thermal measurements, is, is used to characterize the turbulent flow in the fluid mechanics field. If we look at pitting, um, we can we can sort of see pitting. But one one thing to say about the um, frequency spectrum is that if you have a transient and you you calculate its frequency spectrum, the frequency spectrum of many superimposed transients will be the same, just multiplied by the number of transients. It's the way in which power, in, in which noise powers work. Noise powers add. So if you have the power of one transient and you add another one to it, you get twice the power. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they're in opposition or how they're correlated in time. On the long term, on the average behavior, you just get the same shape of power spectrum, but multiplied by the number of transients. Now. In principle, that means, well, if you look at the power spectrum, you should be able to say what the shape of the transient is. But unfortunately, the transient shape does not have a one to one relationship to the power spectrum. A given transient will give it will give a certain power spectrum shape.
but a certain power spectrum shape can be given by many different shapes of transient. So unfortunately, we can't go from the transient, sorry, from the power spectrum to work out what the transients look like. But at least we know that there is a relationship between them. And these are the sorts of things you can get. You can see here again, fairly typical behavior with a plateau at the lower frequencies and then a slope at the higher frequencies. This sharp drop here is because Axel was doing his measurements properly and he had an anti-aliasing filter to take out frequencies above the measurement, or sorry, above half the measurement frequencies because otherwise they can give you errors in this region due to a process known as aliasing. I don't have time to go into that, but it's important to be aware of it. I also show on here a red curve, and this was obtained from the continuous wavelet transform, the CWT. Um, as people working with wavelets and noise tend to think it's different from power spectrum measurements, but basically it isn't. It's the same thing, it's just that it, it looks a bit different because the way in which they plot things are a bit different. Um, and we can use a continuous wavelet transform to measure a power spectrum and it actually gives a quite nice smooth power spectrum. It's quite a nice way of doing it. So we've measured a, a power spectrum for potential. We've measured a power spectrum for current. I think it was probably Car Carol Flagg who thought about dividing the one by the other, other to get a, an impedance spectrum. So you divide the power spectral density of uh, potential by power spectral density of current and you get something with the properties of, of an impedance. We don't get the phase information because um, we, we don't have correlations between the potential and the current. Again, I don't have time to go into that detail, but we can't get the phase information. We, we do get the amplitude information corresponding to the impedance spectrum. Now this is some very early work that Florian Mansfeld did looking at coated samples um, where he's showing this is this noisy stuff here is a Fourier transform uh, uh, spectrum of in, uh, noise impedance or he calls it spectral noise resistance RSN. Uh, he did that because he said it, it wasn't a true impedance because he didn't know what the phase was which is a valid point. Um, and that's compared with an actual impedance measured by the more conventional methods. And you can see in this case, quite a good correlation. Now I extracted this from his original paper. Um, again, you can see the quality, how the quality has changed over the years. Um, the rest of his plots were much worse than this. He had very poor correlation between the noise resistance and the EIS measurement. Uh, but I think the problem was he was making measurements. He started with coated systems that he initially put in for a very short time, one week. And so they still had a very high impedance and noise, noise measurements of impedance are very difficult when you have high impedances. And I suspect his measurements on the high impedance system before the coating started to break down, which is where which was what was happening here. This is this is the seven month plot. Um, so he, in that, those earlier measurements, I believe he was measuring instrument noise. He was measuring the noise that his instruments were producing, not the electrochemical noise from the system. Um, that would need more analysis to be certain of that, but it's certainly he was getting bad measurements before he got to this stage, simply because the, the impedance of the system was just too high. Now, having got uh, frequency spectra, people thought, well, look, this thing is going on over time and the properties are probably changing over time. And why can't we com com calculate spectra as a function of time? And this is where we get into stuff, things called power frequency spectra. Now, there have been many methods used to compute this. Um, I think probably the first person to really do this was um, Axel Homburg using the, this thing, this process, the Hilbert Huang transform. Since then, other people have tried different things. Uh, I worked with Axel for a time to try and look at how we could use the continuous wavelet transform. I prefer this personally because I understand the maths of the continuous wavelet transform. I don't understand the maths of this process, and that's simply because I'm not a very good mathematician. Um, but you know, I, I like to understand what I'm doing. And as, as I say, without being able to read the mathematics very easily, 
it's difficult for some of the subjects, but I spent a long time looking at Fourier transforms, so I do understand how they work. Um, now here's an example just comparing two time frequency spectra. This again is Axel's data on pitting of aluminium, and this is his computation using the Hilbert Huang transform. It's a partially heuristic method in the sense that you you, you look at the spectrum and say, look, when certain things happen, we'll, we'll change behavior. I can't remember exactly the details of it, but it gives nice sharp peaks. If you look at the continuous wavelet transform, it gives much broader peaks. Um, but on the whole, you know, you see a spike in the plot, in the time record, you see a, a peak in this um, time frequency spectrum. My problem with these plots is I really don't know what to do with them once I've got them. Um, if, I, if someone can find good ways of actually making use of them, people do talk about you know frequencies at different you know, different frequencies telling us things about the process that's going on. But that actually shows a, a rather a misunderstanding about power spectra because power spectra, if you have a, a, a transient, the power spectrum is going to be white until it turns over and at, at a higher frequency and gives you the shape of the transient. So the shape of the power spectrum tells you about the shape of the transient. It doesn't tell different frequencies in the power spectrum don't, don't tell you about processes going on in the system uh, unless you have spikes corresponding to oscillations of some sort. And there's a lot of misunderstanding of this I think particularly in the wavelet literature where people will talk about wavelets at certain crystals, which they, which is a term used in wavelet analysis, which is comparable to a frequency. And they talk about crisp, certain crystals being characteristic of certain processes. And I think basically that's a misunderstanding of what the process, what the analysis is doing. But again, that's a personal beef I have against some of the wavelet analysis. And I may be wrong. People have also looked at chaos methods. I'm not going to go into those because I don't understand them. Um, I, I, I know more or less what they're doing, but I've, I've seen analyses done. People, people tend to, what people tend to do in those is they tend to calculate chaos properties of various sorts and try and correlate them with whether the sample is pitting or not pitting or whatever. I'll come back to that in a moment. So I'm not really going to say anything significant about chaos methods. I'm not going to talk about any of the other methods that have been used. And, then, and basically people have thrown every mathematical technique they can at electrochemical noise to see whether it will tell them anything useful. Now I'm not going to give any conclusions. I'm going to give what I've called personal opinions. These, so these are biased. They're based on what we've done. Um, they're based on things that I understand rather than things I don't necessarily understand or don't understand what they're doing. Um, so given my personal opinion, electrochemical noise contains information about the rate and the type of corrosion. The rate can be determined reliably for many systems using the noise resistance, but you get a better result if you use conventional uh, impedance or linear polarization methods. The noise resistance method is a noisy way of measuring polarization behavior or polarization resistance. Linear behavior, linear methods are better. Now it is says that the noise method has the advantage of not polarizing the electrodes. That's sort of true, though in fact if you think about the conventional method where we have two working electrodes, one working electrode is polarizing the other working electrode. So there is some polarization going on, but it's no different than if the electrodes have been joined together. So in that sense, it isn't, it isn't changing the behavior. So that is, that is correct. Um, but you can make conventional methods using um, impedance, particularly where you can use pretty small perturbations and get quite reliable results. Well, I personally would prefer those as ways of making the measurement. EIS in particular gives you more information as well. It gives you information about um, surface processes, about capacitances and so forth. If you have clear individual events occurring, 
look at the time record, see what it will tell you. Don't worry about all the other analyses techniques because it won't, they won't in general tell you anything more. The short noise method, um, again, we're biased, we developed it, um, well, at least we, we, we extended Schottky's work to understand how it applied to corrosion. Um, I believe the low, frequ the low frequency um, characteristic uh, frequency, it, a low value can indicate a tendency to localize corrosion. So I think it's useful in the sense of uh, indicating that localized corrosion is possibly occurring. Power spectrum may give information about localization when clear transients are not observed, but it's fairly difficult to interpret. Um, it's not very intuitive. You don't, you don't tend to think about uh, behaviors in terms of the frequency content of a signal. Uh, and it's, it's not that clear what it's going to tell you. And I say it's not, it, a particular shape of power spectrum doesn't tell you uniquely what shape of transients you've got or indeed how many there are. Time frequency analysis produces pretty pictures. I'll leave it at that. For corrosion monitoring, rather than laboratory studies, the characteristic frequency or something similar is the only realistic technique for giving you information about um, localized corrosion from electrochemical measurements. I say all similar because Honeywell used what they call the pitting factor, I think it was developed by Dave Eden, um, which is mathematically similar to the characteristic frequency or actually one over the characteristic frequency. Uh, the only problem is there's a, there's a, um, a unit problem in the sense that the value that you get depends on how big your electrode is. But if you're using it for corrosion monitoring where you're always using probes of the same size, that doesn't really matter. There is a dream or there was a dream early on in electrochemical noise measurements of sticking a reference electrode into a process plant and measuring electrochemical noise and telling you how the process plant is behaving. I think that is likely to remain a dream. It's far too difficult to make the measurements in the real world. Um, and it's far too difficult to interpret them if you can make any. Uh, the, it, the method was used briefly. Um, actually, I think I may be wrong. It was used to try and monitor corrosion in the nuclear waste storage tanks at Hanford, the Han Hanford nuclear site. I think they were using probes there rather than monitoring on the tanks themselves. So even there, they weren't monitoring the real structure, they were monitoring the, the probes inside the structure. <clears throat> I would also make, give some warnings for anyone who's thinking about um, noise measurement and maybe applying it to their system. Measurement is difficult. Much of the data in the literature is instrument noise or is basically just wrong. You should, you should read papers on electrochemical noise and be aware that the data are not necessarily genuine electrochemical noise. I would also beware of studies that compare re results with a corrosion type that is determined by examination of the time record. It's very common to see people who've made an electrical measurement, they look at the time record, they see transients, they say it's pitting, they do their novel analysis method, they get a certain result and say that result tells us that it's pitting. But they know, but you know, that it's a circular argument. It's telling you that there are transients, but it, you already knew that. What's the point of the experiment? What's it really telling you? <clears throat> I should make some acknowledgements. Um, these are people who have basically either worked with me, discussed things with me, or um, done useful work on electrochemical noise measurements. So we've got a, a number of students, Akin Lota, Walter Richter, Juan Mendoza Flores, Neil Donahoe, Hamid Al Ansari, Majid Alawadi, Julian Bagley, Andrea Petiti, Hannah Amazidi, Ali Abali, Murali Kumaguru, Marius Marti, Abdul Salam Jabril. Stanley Namayonu, Mukhtar Shagluf, and Jose Sanchez Amaya. These are people who've worked with us in one way or another in Manchester, or sometimes uh, remotely. Colleagues in Manchester, I work with Patrick Laycock, a statistician, Dave Eden, who went on from Manchester. He didn't actually work with me on noise in Manchester, but he went on to work uh, 
with Honeywell to develop their noise monitoring techniques. Steve Turgus, who did some of the early analysis with me, John Dawson, who uh, was leading some of the earlier work on noise, Roger Newman, and Michele Curioni, who's taken over some of the work in noise in Manchester. <clears throat> I've also had very close collaboration with Francois Huet, Stéphane Victor, and members of the ECG Comon group, which is looking at corrosion monitoring and nuclear systems. And recently with Axel Holmberg and J.M. Moll, I can't remember his first name, I think it's Jan, um, at uh, Delft. Finally, I should say that none of this would have been possible without the support from my wife of more than 50 years, uh, who managed to look after and raise three beautiful children, despite my managing to be away at conferences whenever they had exams coming up or other critical times in their academic career. Thank you very much.